Hello, and it's 9.30 a.m. in the United States, Eastern Standard Time, and 7 p.m. from Sri Lanka. I'm still waiting to get a go from the organizers, so we'll uh, wait for a few seconds. Okay, let's get started and welcome to Sustainable Education Foundation One Live session. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on which part of the world you are tuning in today. I'm Hasita Mahabaduge. And first of all, an apology is owed to people who do not know me personally, or for the others who haven't met me in years, the person who's conducting this session and the person or the photo you saw in the flyer that belongs to the same person. In fact, the photo was taken several years ago and over the years I've got some gray hair and I believe it would be a good thing because it probably means that I gained some experiences and that's, is, that is why I'm here today with you to share my experiences. So the plan for the next hour or so, I'll start with a quick, a brief introduction about myself, my journey so far over the past, maybe now it's almost nearly four decades. And then I'll pick several of the important steps and then I'll go a little deeper into those areas. However, depending on your interest, depending on your interest, we can go deeper into some of those areas. So keep that in mind. You can guide this discussion towards the end of the discussion. And let's get started. My journey started, oh, I was born and raised 20, uh, born and raised and lived for 25 years in Payagala, Sri Lanka. I received my primary education uh, from Holy Cross College, Kalutara, and then from grade uh, 6 to grade 13, I received my secondary education from St. Peter's College, uh, Colombo, St. Peter's College, Bamblepitia, and then in 2002, I did my advanced level in math stream. Now, if you are smart enough, you can figure out uh, how old I am, and then why I said I'm now almost near to 14 decades, living 14 decades of my life. And then in 2003, I got selected to uh, do physical sciences in uh, at the uh, University of Colombo, Sri Lanka. And I completed that in 2007, during which time also I met my wife. And in 2007 to 2008, I worked as a demonstrator. And then in 2008, came to the United States, came to the United States, and I did my graduate study at the University of Toledo, Ohio. It's in the northern part of the United States. And after completing my PhD in 2013, 2013, I did a postdoc at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, we usually call it NREL, N-R-E-L, in Golden, Colorado. So far, the best experience in my life in terms of my uh, career. And then in 2016, I joined Georgia College as an assistant professor of physics. And to date, for almost five years now, I've, be, I've, at, I've been at uh, Georgia College. And if you read uh, 
the intro to this event and I'll uh, share some of that as well. I shared uh, some of the awards I got or some of the accolades I got and there is a reason for doing so. There are several reasons actually. The first one is obvious to show off. No, I'm kidding. Uh, it's not to show off because at this point I don't know uh, the people who are tuning in. So there's no point of showing off to you. However, there are instances and times that you need to show off, but this is not that for me at least. And then, the, the, so the important thing for you, why it is important to know some of the achieve some of my achievements is the main message I want to share is that I was an average student at the University of Colombo. I was not probably not in the top five. In fact, back in the school days, I probably was in uh, top five. But at the University of Colombo, I was not the brightest of them all. However. As an average student, as an average undergraduate student, over the past eight to 12 years, I, I have achieved a lot. So that's one reason that I uh, uh, li listed out some of my achievements. And let's uh, start from the top. Let's start with year 2020. And year 2020, the world may not remember it as the best it ever had but for me personally and professionally 2020 was a good year professionally because i received the uh, felton jenkins hall of fame award for excellence in teaching as well as i was named as a fellow of the international society for scholarship of teaching and learning and in terms of the uh, hall of fame award it is awarded for excellence in teaching from uh, 28 institutions in the state of Georgia. So it is offered by the university system of Georgia, where we have uh, 28 higher education institutions. And personally, I got to spend five months, complete five months with my now almost two years old son. So personally, that's a luxury that one can ask for as a new dad. And that leads to the perks of being in academia. Let's address the first thing. Usually when we discuss academia, the obvious comparison is between the academia and the industry. And the first thing that comes up as a, that someone might call a disadvantage is the income. For example, if you Look at the statistics in the United States. Average salary for a person in academia is around 80,000 US dollars per year. Usually in US, the salary is uh, said in for the annual salary is shared. So usually the average is around 80,000 US dollars compared to maybe $120,000 in the industry for the same level of experience. However, if you go into administration in academia for the same experiences, you will definitely out earn. That's one. And that average salary I discussed, I, I shared that 80,000K is mostly for 10 month contracts. That brings us to another positive Again, the positive and negative might depend on your uh, personal choice. And I, as a person in academia, I'm biased towards that as well. However, usually that uh, salary is for 10 month contracts. Most of the faculty in the United States are here for 10 month contracts, which means if you need, you can take two or three or the summer months off. However, most of the faculty would do research during that uh, period, intensive research during that period. Therefore, that's one other perk of being in academia, meaning that you can take time off if you really want. And if you really think about it, you might 
be only working for a total of eight months during the year. And one other advantage of being in academia, if you earn tenure, in simple sense, it is a job for life. In this uncertain economy, it is something, it is a peace of mind that one can have. And if you're a fan of, uh, if you're fans of uh, Big Bang Theory, you might remember uh, an episode where the, uh, or the crew is fighting for a tenure position and then uh, Penny asks Leonard, so tenure means a job for life? And then yes, Leonard says yes. And then Penny asks, even if you are not good at it? And then Leonard says, yes, pretty much. And one other advantage, again, I'm uh, listing almost all the advantages, uh, I might be biased as well, is the flexibility to for two for two things to set your own research agenda as well as picking your classes that you need to teach and another advantage is that you get to travel mostly for conferences in my case a quick example from last year in 2019 i i actually visited sri lanka twice went to india and went to China twice, and most of my travel expenses were not out of pocket. And in these days, if you check Facebook, traveling seems to be the hobby of almost everyone. So then imagine you get to do that, and some of your expenses are covered, are not out of pocket expenses. And I said before that you get the chance or the opportunity to set your own research agenda meaning that you can do you can research on the things that you really care about and the difference that i see i might be wrong here i see in academia versus uh, industry in terms of research in industry that research is governed or driven by profit and in academia, you might get an more opportunity or more flexibility to go to do more fundamental research as most of the research may not be driven by profit. However, one disadvantage in academia I see compared to industry is the throughput bringing up an example from uh, my own area of research solar cells. Even at when, when I was at National Renewable Energy Laboratory, the preeminent, the best or the, the only national lab entirely dedicated for renewable energy, I would maybe complete one solar cell per day at best. If you are in research and development in industry, you can do that within seconds that having that higher throughput which means having more money or infrastructure in industry might be beneficial if you need to uh, get faster results and another disadvantage again it depends on your personality in uh, academia you might get some heartbreaks especially when you uh, submit uh, proposals, grant proposals or manuscripts for reviews. And some reviewers, usually the third reviewer would say mean things about your work. But if you don't take it personally, then there aren't any uh, heartbreaks. And th this, is, uh, this might be true for student evaluations as well. It is something different or I haven't seen at least in my time in uh, when I was in Sri Lanka, in undergraduate stu studies, we do not evaluate our instructors. Again, there are good and bad things that we can discuss. However, in the United States, towards the end of the semester, students anonymously review their professors. Most of, most of the people might get uh, good comments, but there, there are some things that students say about you if they don't like you. So again, it depends on your personality, 
And if you uh, don't take those things personally, then that is not uh, as heartbreaking as it seems like. So there are some of the uh, a brief uh, discussion about advantages and disadvantages of being in academia. As I said uh, at the very beginning, we can go into a little deeper into this and then discuss, say, for example, different types of uh, institutions and then what are the expectations. For example, in R1 institutions where the research is more prominent, you might spend 75 to 80% of your time doing research and maybe 10 to 20% in teaching. And if you are at a PUI, predominantly undergraduate institution, you might spend maybe 50% of your time in teaching and then 20, 25% of time in research. And again, depending on your personality, the, the, the rest of the 10% or the 20% is called service. That is being basically being sitting on committees, either chairing those committees and then being a member of committees and from my experience or from at least what I've heard from others as well people it's something that people do not enjoy as much as they enjoy research or teaching however irrespective of your institution whether it's an R1 or PUI you have those service assignments or being simply working on committees and then uh, that's a kind of brief overview about the academia or the perks of being in academia. We can go into a little bit more details, but let's track back, come back to how to get into the academia, starting from your undergraduate studies. And I believe most of you are, who are watching, if you are an undergraduate student, you can see and find the basic things that you need to do in order to get into a graduate school. Therefore, what I would like to do here is to focus on some other things that you may not read or you or people may not share with you. That is some kind of human aspects. For example, it's true that all of us know for uh, getting into graduate school in the United States, you need to do GRE you need to do uh, TOEFL and you need to have a decent uh, GPA, some things like that. However, what we usually don't say out loud or we think that we cannot control is the uh, recommendation letter, for example, getting a good recommendation letter. Now being on the other side of the spectrum, I can assure you that your recommendation letter has a more weight than you think, especially if you don't have a 4.0 GPA. And I believe most of us, including myself, we uh, most of us might not have a 4.0 GPA. Th that is okay. You can still get into uh, your graduate studies. And you think, you might think that you do not have any control over the recommendation letters you get from your advisors or from your from the faculty members but what i would like to share with you is that you can influence that recommendation letter meaning provide us the faculty who write those recommendation letters with some facts that we that makes you stand out from the rest know that all of the students they do all the standard courses so it won't make you stand out for example one example might be you presented at a conference or you published in a conference proceedings something like that give us some solid example solid evidence that we can write something special about you getting the good recommendation letter is a key and as faculty, now being on the other spectrum, other end of the spectrum, we do have our own code words to say whether you are a good match or uh, not. So personally, I would have three sets of recommendation letters. And then I say, when a student requests a recommendation letter, I say usually this is what I can do. Because in, faculty, in uh, academia, we trust each other, meaning the faculty. So we give, the, give our uh, best recommendation 
to other institutions as well. So that's one key aspect. So plan now to have and maintain a good professional relationship with your research advisor or your mentor. And the next thing that you do not see in blogs or in uh, other advi uh, advising uh, sites is the key is to have a good friend. It might be your uh, girlfriend or boyfriend as well, but having a good friend is also a key to getting into the grad school to have someone to work with. And then to maintain that uh, relationship. So make sure when you choose your friends or people whom you associate with, you pick the right people. At least for me, that was the key. And those are two of the kind of uh, human aspects of getting into grad school that we may not discuss in, uh, in public, usually in public, usually. And the same would be true when you get into your graduate school, graduate studies, that is to maintain a good professional relationship with your advisor for the five to seven years or depending on which uh, country or which area three to five years or five to seven years and especially getting the getting into the next position your advisor will be the key so keep that in mind as well and graduate school again being said that choosing uh, the correct graduate advisor is the is another good uh, is something that you need to think of and rest of your career might depend on that one particular decision you make as a freshman in the grad school so keep that in mind as well and then there are two things that i would uh, like to uh, quickly discuss the years uh, 2007 and 2008 where I worked as a demonstrator and the uh, years 2014 and 2015 where I worked as a postdoctoral researcher, I consider those two as bridge years, as bridge years, especially in the context of Sri Lanka, working that one year as a demonstrator, you get some uh, decent pay, which might cover some of the expenses for your uh, GRE and TOEFL examinations and then get some time for you to study as well. So then use those bridge years wisely. The same would be true for a postdoc. There are some people who might continue to be in that position for long, but my personal recommendation, my personal suggestion is use those, uh, use those years as a postdoc as a bridge. And getting into that details of being a postdoc, it gives you a lot of uh, time and some freedom, some freedom within the group, within, within the research group to do or invest yourself more into research. And that might be a good time to think of which path you would like to pursue, whether you'd like to go into academia and or whether you like to go into industry for me i liked and i enjoy being in academia for one reason something that i didn't uh, mention if i go back to uh, my school days uh, at st peter's college i uh, like uh, i was heavily involved with uh, societies and associations say single literary association as uh, amateur astronomers association geography and history society many societies and then I loved public speaking. I enjoyed it and that was instrumental, that was a key for me to uh, enjoy what I do today. And I was never good at uh, sports back in the school day, not in any kind of sport, not even at uh, chess because one might think if you, are, if you have a PhD in physics you might be good at uh, chess or something like that but I was never good in any kind of sports. But I, but public speaking was something that I liked and I loved. So it was something that I enjoyed a lot, which helped me to enjoy 
what I do today as a teacher, in a way as a performer, because teaching in, in, in some sense is kind of a performance as well. So keep those things in mind and that bridge here of being a postdoc might give you a chance to think through what are your life priorities. And as I said, when it comes to uh, academia, you get the flexibility and then flexibility both in your research agenda as well as uh, getting some time off if you need. You imagine getting uh, two to three months off in uh, uh, industry. It will probably not happen unless you become a, unless you get a parent uh, parental leave. Therefore, those are some of the things that uh, one might enjoy. And then the travel seems to be a good trend in these days. So keep that in mind as well when you make those decisions. Those are some of the key things that I uh, would like. To, I just thought that I'll uh, set the stage up with that. Maybe I'll pause for a few minutes if there are any uh, comments or questions that you have. And uh, let's uh, take it from there. I'll take maybe a few seconds, a minute or so for you to post any questions or comments that you have as of now. Okay, let's uh, continue then. Let's uh, get into more details about the uh, about uh, graduate studies and then the uh, postdoc. In graduate studies, if at this point or if uh, you are thinking of going into academia, it might be good to uh, get some exposure into teaching as well. Usually, in the United States. The first year of your graduate studies, first of your first year of your graduate studies, you will uh, be a teaching assistant, and it's most of the time you will serve as a teaching assistant unless you get a research assistantship. And for me, uh, I during my last year as well, during my uh, fifth year as well, I also got the opportunity to work as a teaching assistant for a different kind of a activity and that helped me to make a case for my uh, teaching career and we said that there are a few comments on how I cannot see those comments
anyway, uh, let me continue with that. And uh, uh, even as a postdoc, again, if you are thinking of going into academia, it might be good to look out for opportunities for teaching. That is something that they are asking for when you are in when you are coming to an interview for an, a job in an academia as a mostly we start as an assistant professors and a little bit about the uh, process of the assistant professor getting into a uh, tenured uh, position at a university this the the uh, interview the interview the interview usually would take about two days two days in person interview and then again it would follow the standard traditional interview process that we'll have in uh, industry as well most of the time you would have a uh, over the phone or skype or zoom interview and then followed by an in-person interview and when you get into uh, those interviews it is beneficial to have some background in teaching some experiences in teaching the way you can get some of that experience is to get that experience is to do some teaching for example if you are a postdoc if you are a postdoc then if you are a postdoc then work with your advisor and if your advisor is teaching a course maybe you can do or teach part of that course that serves two purposes one is that it would give you and give you some experience if you decide to go into academia and it obviously would give you a taste of what teaching feels like and it might be a good uh, place for you to start thinking i got some uh, comments from Comments, although I couldn't see it here, somehow I uh, some of the one of the organizers sent me some uh, questions. I'll quickly read through. Can you discuss about ILTS versus TOEFL and GRE general scores? That might be helpful for students. In my uh, opinion and experience, at least in the case of uh, United States, GRE and TOEFL, especially TOEFL, that is set by the graduate. Uh, school not specif uh, specifically from the graduate program therefore if they set up a minimum value if they set up a minimum value you need to have that value and some there are some institutions in the United States that who do not require GRE GRE subject for that matter as well my personal recommendation is if your GPA for example, physics or computer science, if your GP for physics, at least for physics, if your GPA is not the best, maybe if it is around 3.3 point or so, then uh, doing GRE subject, subject test might be uh, important. However, for GRE, it is the numbers are set by the graduate school. So you need to get that number because the application process first it goes through the graduate school before it uh, reaches the search committee department search committee therefore there will be uh, uh, they will filter those basic therefore and back in the day when i uh, was uh, when i was applying TOEFL was preferred for united states compared to ilts but now I see that uh, some of the, at least some of the universities post uh, both scores for ILTS and TOEFL. And GRE general score, again, it is set by the graduate program. Therefore, you need to have that minimum to get in. That's why if you recall at the beginning, somewhere in the talk, I said it's good to have a good friend to work with. So getting some help from your friends, especially in preparing for these uh, exams, might be important to have a good friend, uh, for at least for that particular reason. And then a uh, uh, question came from Spencer. Will you talk about being on a search committee for 
new faculty. Yeah, so the, I have been in uh, several search committees for both the uh, new faculty as well as for department chair. And th that's why I said that recommendation letters, we do rely on recommendation letters as well, mostly on the recommendation letters, I would say. And again, what is important thing is what makes you stand out from the rest. When you apply for the graduate school, Spencer Short is uh, one of my good uh, students. So I'll uh, take him for example as well. He's now at uh, CU Boulder, CU Boulder doing his uh, PhD in uh, mathematics. And in, in the case of uh, Spencer, for example, most of the students in, at least some of the students in US would do undergraduate research. For the case of Spencer, he was involved with uh, two faculty at Georgia College, when he was at Georgia College, and then it made him stand out. And then he did uh, at least one or maybe two international uh, research experiences. Again, those things makes you stand out. Same would be true for when you're getting into a new faculty position, what makes you stand out from the rest? Almost all of the applicants they will have a PhD in the respective field. They will have a PhD in physics, they will have a PhD in computer science, because that is one of the requirements set uh, to have a terminal degree. To have a terminal degree is one of the requirements. So out of that pool with PhDs in your respective field, PhDs with physics and computer science, what makes you stand out? In my case, uh, as a postdoc, uh, I, my research area is in solar cells. As a postdoc at National Renewable Energy Laboratory, I was the first author or the lead author of the publication that uh, reported the world record for flexible cadmium telluride solar cells. So that particular achievement, that particular publication made me stand out from the rest. At least th that's what I've heard after uh, I got it from the, uh, after I got the position. And then being humble, this probably might, shouldn't be new to you, but being humble will uh, reward you more and more. For example, especially going along the same lines for the search committee, you, uh, as I said, there would be in-person uh, uh, interviews, in-person interviews where you would be, would also be evaluated by students. How well do you interact with students? Again, these are all kind of unofficial interactions, meaning that you would go to lunch or dinner with students. How would you respect the students? Those things do count. The human aspect do count in those interviews. And especially when you talk uh, with the faculty, how would you respect their research, for example? We might have our personal opinions on which research area is the best, which area of study is the best, but you need to keep some of those to yourself and you need to learn to respect others, especially when, uh, when getting into new faculty positions. We have our own uh, prejudice on different types of research areas, but when we interact with faculty, we need to keep that in mind as well. So on a search committee, getting a new position as well as on search committees, those are the things that we look for. Because again, if we go by the main, with the checklist, almost everyone would have a, a PhD, almost everyone would have some research experience, some, so then those minor things would matter. Those minor things, meaning the human interaction that we usually don't teach, or we don't offer courses in human interaction, those things do matter. Can I just know the key points? Uh, this question came from uh, Varuni. Can I just know the key points that we should check when selecting a grad school? My uh, recommendation key points, if you are, uh, again, my experience comes from the United States. So I'll uh, start, I'll just share that experience. When selecting a grad school, 
the first and foremost advice if you are in uh, Sri Lanka, if you are an undergraduate in Sri Lanka at this point, my suggestion is to get into any grad school. Again, this might not be the advice you are looking for, but my advice is get into any grad school that you get selected for. Then, because some of the things that we think uh, back when we were in Sri Lanka, we might be not aware of some of the advantages, disadvantages of different states, for example, different states or different research areas. Therefore, the first suggestion is to get into the United States for any program. And now let, let's break it down a little further. Uh, the key points that I looked at that point, I didn't have an idea. I only saw the map of the United States. So then uh, I picked several, uh, my, uh, back in the day, maybe about uh, now it's 12, 13 years ago, I uh, went with the website, the color of the website. Those are the crazy things that I uh, did back in the day. But make sure what uh, research area do they have. They would highlight that research area. And why I said not to be limited by that is the research area that you might uh, you might not be aware of some of the research areas that exist today. Some of the websites may not uh, have that. So then, uh, but if you're looking for, if you're selecting those research areas, uh, selecting based on some of the key points, uh, research area would be one. It might be helpful if there are some uh, Sri Lankans around the university. For me, it was a big thing. I, uh, uh, Dr. Zilani Artigala and Dinesh Artigala, they helped me a lot. I, uh, I didn't uh, know them before I went to University of Toledo, but having some uh, Sri Lankans uh, around would help you to settle down. So that might be one thing that you need to think. And research area, what kind of uh, the uh, what kind of the environment uh, and then have your expectations to minimum have your expectations to minimum that would help you to enjoy more of what you have a question came from uh, Asel says as a computer science undergrad what factors should I prioritize the most when applying for grad school to improve my chances of getting selected for a good university personally I would say the uh, have a uh, decent publication record. From my understanding, there are few uh, recognized conferences rather than journals in computer science. So if you can uh, submit your submit your research to uh, such uh, conferences, either in Sri Lanka or internationally or international conferences, that would have you that would give you an edge compared to having a good uh, GPA. Again, strive to have the best GPA that you can, but if it's not possible, then there are things that you can do to complement that uh, GPA. One thing is uh, have a publication record and then try to have something quantifiable or tangible. Th th that's something that I always share with my students, have something tangible that is have a product that you worked for for example that uh, that you volunteered for or you have a position at uh, sustainable education foundation is not mentioning that is not enough but add something to, to something to that list saying as a uh, abc at sustainable education foundation i coordinated the say for example the one live session and then i trained these many people to take uh, over from my uh, responsibility so then have something quantifiable and highlight those we do value uh, those types of uh, experiences as well again everybody would have a decent gpa about 3.0 gpa everybody would have done the same courses so then what is what makes you stand out a few more questions came i'm hoping to do higher studies in usa uh, currently, I'm undergraduate in physics. Can we do masters in USA and do a job in USA 
with scholarship, TA with stipend, financial support. Good question. Uh, good question. My, uh, can we do masters in USA and do a job in USA with scholarship? Yes. And uh, for it's uh, good to hear that you are in physics and uh, for physics and mostly for physics, chemistry and math, we get uh, Sri Lankans get more chances because in the United States we need more TAs to run undergraduate labs. Therefore, uh, to do your masters or your PhD, you almost at least in my case you do not need to pay anything. Uh, you would be given a stipend, a decent stipend to uh, live maybe slightly below to live your American dream, but good enough to have a healthy, uh, healthy family. So uh, yes, uh, they would uh, provide a stipend. And can we do masters in USA and do a job? Again, the answer is yes. My personal recommendation, if there aren't any other, say, personal restrictions or any other issues, complete a PhD, you would get uh, higher uh, higher chances. You would have higher chances of getting into a job with a master's in the US compared to a PhD because of the different pay scales that they need to afford. Therefore, the chances of getting into industry with a master's is higher. Is uh, the chances are higher? But my personal recommendation would be to do a PhD because when you are at the age of uh, 35, 40, when it that when it's the time to go for the next say promotion, next promotion, the education, uh, your uh, final your education status might matter. A PhD is called a terminal degree for a reason. So then, my personal uh, suggestion, my personal suggestion would be to, if you are capable, and if you do not have any other obligations, complete a PhD. And we say that you can always go back and then complete those things. Sometimes we may never do that. But when times come, at the age of 40, 45, then it might not be the time to go back and do uh, studies. Because now, as undergrads, you are in your prime time for studies. And after when you reach or go about 40, it would be difficult to stand for one hour in one place. Uh, another question came as a grad student in my final months of uh, master studies. I would like to know if I should start my PhD as soon as I graduate MSc or is it okay to take a break from studies and continue my PhD later? Does this really matter to the consistency of my studies? To answer the last question, does this matter to the consistency of my studies? No, but I think I briefly touched on that in the in my previous comment as well. I would encourage to complete it. I would encourage to complete it. So then you, in a way, you have some kind of peace of mind as well, because that you have completed your studies. There are many things to learn, but there are aren't any other thing to achieve. So in a way, I would uh, recommend to continue soon after MSc for maybe for another reason that, as I said, recommendation letters, getting into PhD or getting into a faculty position, the recommendation letters do matter. And with time, if you take a break, say for four or five years, we might forget what, I mean, as a faculty member, I might forget what you did as an undergraduate or in this case as a master's student and then I might write a general recommendation letter. I might forget some of the things that made you stand out in your master's program or in your uh, undergraduate studies. I might forget those specific details. Those specific details do matter. Therefore, my personal recommendation, again, my personal recommendation is to continue and uh, I think I remember saying the same for uh, Spencer Short. Spencer is uh, Spencer sent a message here to not to take a year off from uh, his uh, studies. He, uh, he did take it 
he did the year off and then had a good time in uh, traveling around Europe. And however, my personal recommendation would be not to take uh, those uh, breaks just to continue. Then it would be easy to uh, keep that momentum. It would be easy to keep that momentum. And in the case for uh, Spencer, we, the people who provided him with recommendation letters, we remembered him plus he continued to maintain his uh, relationship with uh, his uh, faculty mentors. So then that helped us to remember who uh, Spencer was and what specific things he did compared to other students that uh, he that uh, stood out. So then that would be my recommendation as well. What is the best time to apply for? This came from uh, Dilu Munasinghe. What is the best time to apply for a grad school? Since most of the scholarships look for publications, should we wait till we publish our research papers or is it okay to apply when we are done with our final year? So I would uh, recommend to do it uh, do it uh, in your final year because in the United if again all of my uh, explanations come in the uh, as uh, having a US as the base we have strict uh, deadlines we have not strict we have deadlines and for the past 12 13 years January 15th was the deadline to apply for graduate studies at the University of Toledo it didn't change covid didn't change most of those deadlines. Therefore, uh, I would recommend preparing for preparing for uh, for your preparing application soon after you graduate. And it is okay to have a pending publication, pending publication or uh, pending conference proceedings. And one other advantage of having that is then say within a month or two or three, and you might get it accepted. So then you can uh, email the committee chair, uh, graduate, in this case, a uh, graduate uh, committee chair, that your publication is accepted. And then within uh, two or three weeks, it might get published. Then you can uh, say, okay, now my publication is uh, published, my publication is published. So then during those different stages of your publication, you, excuse me, you can still, you can uh, maintain that communication with the graduate search committee that might again help you, help uh, them to remember you. So then uh, what is the best time to apply for a grad school? Again, that is set by the, the, the deadlines are set by the respective universities and it sure is an advantage to have publication, but the publication to complete that process, it takes time. Therefore, my recommendation would be the, not to wait until your uh, publication is uh, publicly available. Publicly available, you can put in your CV or resume that one, that uh, publication is pending, and then later it is accepted and then uh, and then uh, publish uh, and then keep, keep that continuation keep, keep that uh, uh, the uh, keep that discussion going with the research uh, advisor and then is a fully funded phd programs still available so this came from uh, derek my good friend uh, is fully funded phd programs still available even after COVID crisis, yes, the funding for research may have a uh, little bit uh, changes in the funding, but the overall funding status is the is there. Uh, reason for most of the fully funded PhDs, you work as a teaching assistant or research assistant, then in the United States, for higher education, for all the to run most of the undergraduate labs, you need teaching assistants, and that didn't uh, change with the COVID crisis. That didn't change with the COVID crisis. Therefore, you would still get a chance to have a fully funded PhD programs, and then it is true even in the COVID crisis. So that is one of my personal plugs 
for being in the academia it is the it might it might be the least kind of uh, least uh, affected by these uh, types of scenarios and personally i heard that uh, most of the people they were either furloughed or they had some pay cuts at least in my case uh, in terms of uh, my earnings it uh, didn't change in fact uh, there was some uh, increase in uh, for my personally for me in terms of uh, financial uh, in in terms of uh, my uh, salary and other things so then uh, that's a good thing that uh, academia is comparatively uh, uh, less uh, vulnerable to these types of crises how do you think is the best way to get working experience while doing higher studies after my bachelor's degree do you recommend completing academic qualification first or gaining experience as the best way to go uh, i got on the so uh, let me uh, take one more minute how do you think is the best way to get working experience while doing higher studies after my bachelor's degree do you recommend completing academic qualification first or gaining experience as the best way to go my personal recommendation and then what i have seen uh, most of the people do would be completing the academic qualifications as they work especially after the especially after the bachelor's there are most of the academic qualifications you can do either uh, on weekends or uh, in the in, in the covid uh, era you can do it online so i would uh, my personal recommendation again it would depend in uh, it, it would depend on your personal interest and your personal character but my personal recommendation would be to complete to gain experience while doing the while completing the academic qualifications mostly during these times you can do this online or, or during the weekend so that would be my uh, recommendation and elaborate uh, could you please elaborate something related to civil engineering field and the possibilities of higher studies in us yes engineering is uh, again both engineering physics or the what they call the stem fields there are opportunities and we can as sri lankans most of us can get those opportunities because they do need uh, ts and therefore they would have uh, openings for most of those uh, most of those positions and then my suggestion would be do not limit yourself to the specific field whether it's civil engineering or electro electronic engineering or computer engineering or uh, such that but uh, market yourself as a person with an engineering degree rather than uh, if for example if you think or if you see that there are less opportunities if you narrow it to uh, civil engineering or elec uh, electrical engineering or electronics then market yourself as a, as an engineer my specialty in physics is condensed matter or solid state physics i might not use it depending on where i for example if i'm applying for positions i would only market myself as a person with a phd in physics so that might be a that might be a good uh, good suggestion uh, good suggestion as well uh, after msc or phd to do a job in usa is it a must to get uh, american citizen the direct answer is no you would only need to be a citizen if you are working in a highly uh, classified project that would be true for even for graduate studies so most of us who are not uh, us citizens would not get assigned to say for example uh, programs funded by uh, military or programs funded by uh, yeah, yeah programs funded by military they won't uh, we won't get assigned to that but to do uh, to do your higher studies or to do a job in the us you do not need to uh, be an american citizen in most of interviews nowadays as i heard heading 
in US Embassy encourage PhD students to come for Sri Lanka after their studies, how to face this situation. Uh, it, it didn't uh, change since the, uh, since the time that uh, I went for my uh, visa interview as well. Again, the reason is that the, the visa category you are applying, uh, that is uh, F1 visa, F1 visa is, has a non-immigrant purpose, non-immigrant purpose, therefore you need to prove that. So embassy encourage PhD students to come for Sri Lanka after their studies, so how to face this situation. I think back in the day, I mean, I didn't do that, but uh, some of my friends, even we used to uh, take some uh, deeds of our houses and then to prove that we have strong ties to uh, Sri Lanka. But I don't think that it might be a significant issue. And then uh, we can talk offline as well. And you can uh, shoot me an, uh, either email or uh, on Facebook or LinkedIn, we can connect and then we can uh, keep in touch. We've uh, almost uh, reached the uh, allocated time for this session. So maybe to uh, sum up what I said, again, academia is a good uh, career path to uh, be, especially and uh, as one of the questions came up, to be especially in uh, during these uh, types of uh, scenarios, you would, uh, at the beginning, you would get uh, less uh, financial benefits in terms of salary, but if you are going into administration, then again, being in academia outpays compared to industry, you get the flexibility of, you get the flexibility of setting up your own research agenda, and then uh, again, the working uh, hours, even the working hours, we can decide when we would like to teach. If you are a morning person, you can ask, you can uh, select a course to teach at 8 a.m. Or if you prefer to go late, you can teach a class in the afternoon. There are some flexibilities as well, something that I shouldn't uh, say out loud, but I said it anyway. And uh, two or three key things. If you're an undergraduate student, make sure you associate the right people. Make sure to have a good body that help you throughout the process or be the person who helps uh, your friends to motivate again sometimes i mean luckily i got through my gre and toefl the first time but some of us might not uh, get through gre and toefl so then you might need somebody to lean on to make sure that you have a good body make sure to have build and maintain a good relationship with your undergraduate uh, research advisor, with your graduate advisor, and then when you come to the college, then maybe department chair and dean, and then make sure you know how to market yourself, starting start it with, uh, with your undergraduate studies, that is important, and to market means do something that makes you stand out from the rest and then market it. And finally, irrespective of where you go, what you do, make sure to be humble. That is my final message. And thank you everyone for tuning in and please make sure to uh, reach out. And then if you have further questions, my first name, H-A-S-I-T-H-A, last name, M-A-H-A-B-A-D-U-G-E, and if you need to send emails, I, you can use uh, hasita pm at gmail or my uh, university email, my first name dot last name at gcsu.edu. Thank you. And then I'm going to end the live video now. Have a good rest of the day and a good weekend. Bye for now.